Good morning, folks. <clears throat> you just found out who was really in charge right then. <laughs> the guys in the booth are calling the shots. Uh, before we get into the lesson today, I just, I just want to say about Houston. Houston, you've had a huge impact on these guys, and we love you. And we're, I, I, I don't know if this was announced, but they're staying here as members, and I'm really happy about that. Like, they're not leaving forever, which is awesome. So they're still here, uh, and we'll be members of the congregation. And I just pray that you guys pray. F- I ask that you guys keep praying for them as, as they're, they're moving forward in their, their family life. Because we love you. We love you guys. Um, another thing, did anyone see a plane flying over the church building this morning? Nobody. Okay. There was one. There was a plane, and it had a banner on the back. And uh, I'll be honest, I wasn't wearing my glasses, so I'm not quite sure what it said. I asked Harper. She couldn't see it either. But I believe it was vote no on 820 on Tuesday. Is that correct? Is that a thing? Okay. Wait, did, is that what it said? Uh, that is correct. Okay. If y'all don't know, there, there's a vote coming up whether or not to legalize recreational marijuana here in Oklahoma. Uh, you have a choice about the world that you live in. And, and do you want to live in a world uh, that, that feeds the bad or empowers the good? And that's, that's your choice. And, and you, need to, you need to let that be known. Uh, my brother works in a rehab facility with people who are eaten alive by drugs and a lot of the talk is that marijuana that doesn't really play a role oh yeah it does uh, it plays a huge role and, and and hurts a whole lot of people and do you want to empower that or not let your let your vote be, be let your voice be heard go vote that that's what i got to say about that um we are talking about i'm back to we're, we're february was our month of prayer now i'm going back uh, to John. We're going to look at John. And John is all about life in his name. And I want to read you this from John 20. Uh, at the end of the book, John kind of gives a purpose statement for what he's talking about. He says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. What John writes, and he, he's specifically talking about the signs But this whole book is designed to win people over to Jesus. To show and convince that Jesus is the Messiah, that long-awaited for Savior of the Jewish people. And not only that, He is the Son of God. And and He's writing these things so you will come to Him and find life. Because apart from Him, there's nothing but death. So come and have life. So it's evangelistic. He's trying to win non-believers into becoming believers and I think we could take it another step because most of us in here are believers. You could take it another step, and he's trying to, to win believers over completely. Because there are still parts of our lives that are, are not under the lordship of Christ. And maybe we have, we have gaps in our faith or doubts or fears, and, and we can read the book of John and be won over wholly and completely to God and find life in Christ. So, turn to John chapter 1. We'll start in verse 9. Uh, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bump back to verse 4, and, and then we'll go to 9. Verse 4, in him was life, Jesus And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 9, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Life and light. You find, you find those concepts a lot in the book of John. And one thing light does is reveal. If, if we turn off all the lights in this auditorium, and I screamed, run for your lives, what would happen? 
chaos, right? People would be trampled. People would get hurt. But if all the lights are on and I scream that, uh, number one, probably people wouldn't scramble and get hurt. And number two, everybody would look around and go, Kevin, you're wrong. There's no re- need to do this. Light reveals things. Light shows the truth of things. Uh, if you walk in darkness, you can, you can get in trouble. When I was a youth minister, we had, I guess it was a lock-in, and we turned off all the lights and played hide-and-seek, right? You guys do that? I think church buildings are designed for that, right? That's really why we do what we do in church buildings, because they're perfect, perfect for that kind of thing. Anyway, we're, uh, I was in the auditorium, and suddenly I hear a splash and a scream because a girl was hiding by the baptistry and fell into the baptistry. <laughs> that would not have happened if the lights had been on, right? Unless somebody shoved her, which I suspect may have happened. Light reveals things. As we go through John, as you look at the life of Jesus, the light that was in him reveals things. The light shone and revealed the hearts of men, some to condemn, some to save. That light revealed where their hearts were. It showed uh, what they truly desired. So when Jesus, when Jesus is healing people, when he's performing miracles, there's a stark contrast between the disciples and between the Pharisees and the scribes. Uh, some of them see the things that Jesus says. For example, uh, we'll, we'll come on this. The man that was born blind and Jesus gave him sight. And the next thing you know, he gets called onto the carpet by the religious authorities. Uh, it revealed the heart of, who the, relig- of the religious authorities. Jesus was there to save. Jesus' uh, followers saw that and their faith grows. But, but other people were revealed to have darkness in their hearts. When Lazarus, when Jesus raises a man from the dead, you would think everybody around would be ecstatic. But his disciples were, they were, they were ecstatic. A man was dead, now he's alive. Jesus saved his friend Lazarus from death itself. And yet, the Pharisees and the scribes went off to plot how to kill Jesus. So that light revealed their hearts. Matthew 15, 8 This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Some of them saw that light, and that light condemned them because it showed the truth. Others, the light shone and it saved. So as we're looking at Jesus' life here, this should reveal truth to us about who we are. Not just about him, but it also reveals our true self and our true nature. In John 1. Verse 12, let's reread that. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What does that mean to you? To be a child of God. What weight does that carry in your life? I don't know that there is a greater privilege or honor than to be called God's child. Do you? High, it's a higher honor than becoming a CEO of a company or a political leader or a president of the United States. If you're God's kid, if you're his, that, that is an honor beyond all measure. And if you think about it, if your own children or uh, your own parents, it grants unprecedented access to the creator of the universe. Uh, la- this whole last month, we were talking about prayer and how we enter before the throne of grace with confidence. When we pray and step into the courtroom of God, we, we go in there as people who belong. People who, who are, are His and who are there. Uh, when I go to my mom and dad's house, I don't knock on the door, ring the doorbell, do you? When my kids want food from my house... They don't have to ask permission, right? In fact, they just kind of expect it. They kind of take it for granted that they're going to eat at the house, right? Because they're children of that household and they belong there. In the same way, you have access to God. You don't, you don't have to go through anybody else. If you are his child, you can go to him in prayer anytime. You're his And the riches of your father are at your disposal. 
Father who gives and gives and gives. Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. They are yours because you are his child. So, with that in mind, the fact that you are God's daughter or you are God's son, here are some things that go along with that. Here are some perks of being called God's child. Number one, you have a family. You have a family. Uh, this may not be your flesh and blood family, because if you go back to, to John uh, 1 there, you became God's child, not by the will of man or, or by the power of people, but by the will of God himself. You have God's family. Think about your family and what it means to you. Now, now some families are, are more healthy than others. If you don't have a healthy family, imagine a healthy family. Uh, my dad, um, we got a text this morning from my brother, who's an elder down at the church at Blanchard. And my mom and dad moved there a couple of years ago. And my brother sent me a picture of my dad teaching their Bible class this morning. And if you heard my dad teach a Bible class or saw my dad teach a Bible class, it wouldn't surprise you that two of his sons became preachers and one of them only became an elder. That wouldn't, <laughs> that wouldn't shock you. I'm just kidding. Th that black sheep elder over there. Uh, no, it wouldn't shock you because, because that's our family. That's, that's part of who we are. You have a family of people who love you and care about you. Brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, you've been granted this family. Uh, are you taking advantage of it? Are you fully throwing yourself into it? In a family, you find place and acceptance. In a family, you start discovering who you are, your identity, and your role. And that all takes place in that family context. Last week, I called Kelly out. I, when I said a scripture and I said, hey, Kelly, that's in the New Testament. That was a joke. I know Kelly knows it's in the New Testament. I just said that because Jake does that stuff. Her big brother does that stuff to her all the time, she told me. So maybe family isn't all that great. I, I don't know. I, <laughs> man, in your family, that, that's where you find identity and hope and, and nurture and encouragement. And, and that's the place you belong without having to ask. It's what church is. Sometimes we've, make, we've made church into something else where, where you have to, I don't know, be at a certain level or whatever. That's not what family is. You're family because you're His. You belong to God. We belong to God. That makes us family. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 12. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. His family came to see him, his literal physical family. Mom and brothers came to see him, and he used that as a teaching moment to say, hey, whoever does the will of God, that's my brother and sister and mother. So you have a family, but part of that family is Jesus as your family. And if you're, you're walking with God, you're doing the will of the Father. To Jesus, you're his brother. Guys, how does that make you feel? As Jesus as your brother. Ladies, you're his sister. Or his mother. He might feel that way about you a little bit. How does that impact you? How does that change the way you operate and the way you walk? You have family in Christ. Also, you begin to bear the family resemblance. Does anybody in here look like their, their mom or their dad? Or their uncle? Joe, who do you look like? Look like his dad. Okay. Okay, look at this picture right here. You may recognize Harper there on the left with her soccer ball. Who's that on the right with her soccer ball? That's her mama. Courtney. Yeah, Courtney was like a little blonde girl. That's kind of a fuzzy picture, but but our kids resemble us. And in the same way that that, that works, in the family of God, you start resembling your father. Your nature changes. You start thinking differently and acting differently. Now, now, in physical families, their physical characteristics are passed down. But have you also noticed that your personality, moms and dads, have been passed down to your kids? And how much does that bother you sometimes? <laughs> that your kids act just like you or your spouse? 
We bear the family resemblance. Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. We start looking like Jesus. Now, you may not think that, but over time, as you're walking with God and you're in his word and you're praying and you're serving and you're obeying, God is, is molding you, working on your character to create in you Christ-likeness. That's, in fact, that's what this whole Christianity thing is about. It's not, show, it's not about showing up in a building. Uh, the Christianity thing is about helping us to be like Jesus, saving us and transforming us. Those are, the, those are the two things God wants to do. Those are the eternal purposes of God. He wants to save all mankind. And then once saved, he wants to change us and transform us to be like Jesus. So believe it or not, as you're walking with God, you're going you're gonna to take on some of Christ's attributes. And you may start being patient like Jesus was patient. Maybe, maybe you'll start being holy like Jesus is holy. Righteous, like he is righteous. You'll be turning your back on the bad and embracing the good. Not only your internal character will change, but the things that you do will change. Look at what Jesus did. Is your life reflecting that? Jesus came to tell people about the kingdom of God. He told them to teach, or he came to teach about who God is and, and what you'll find in him. You're going to find yourself doing the same things. He came to help in whatever way he could help. I mean, when, when Jesus encountered somebody in need, he brought the power that he had to bear to that problem. In the same way you and I do, we do that. When somebody's in help, when need, need of help, when they need encouragement, when they need lifted up, uh, you bring the power that God has given you to that problem. You may not think it's much, but you give as God has given you. And you help. You look out for people that are downtrodden. You look out for people uh, that are poor. You, you look out for people uh, who are afflicted. You look out for people who may just need somebody to come alongside of them. Because that's what Jesus did. And that's what he did. And that's what we do. You bear the family resemblance. And next thing you know, you're going to be a little bit more like Jesus than you were the day before. And your life will have impact to the extent that you resemble Jesus. Also, you'll have a home. My soul lives in a little house on the corner of Diamond and Burton in Holdenville, Oklahoma. We were five years old. I moved into, we moved into this house. And it's a hundred-year-old house. It's old. Baby, what style of house is that? I can never remember. Tudor. It's a Tudor house. T-U-D-O-R. Not, yeah. Tudor house. It is, it's just old brick and I love it. I love that house because from five until I graduated high school at 22 years old, I lived in that, until <laughs> yeah. 18, that was my home. And that's where I experienced all the richness of family. Uh, that's, that's where I, I, the, the seeds of who I am now were planted and, and watered and fertilized and looked after. That's, that's my home. That, that was my sanctuary. It's, it's a big old house. And the upstairs was just a renovated attic. And when I say renovated, I mean they just tacked some flimsy walls up. So the walls were coming at you from all angles. And my bedroom had a fake zebra carpet on it. So black and white. Just Z, it'd give you a headache if you looked at it too long. And I loved it. There was no air conditioning or heat or air upstairs. It was miserable. And I loved it. I loved it. Home, but now, honestly, obviously, it wasn't really about the house, though, was it? It's about all the things that happened in that house. Home. But, but home means security. Home means replenishment. Getting your strength back. Home means means comfort. Home means that's where you can let your hair down and just be you. There's a home waiting for you. Second Corinthians 5, 1. We know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 
Jesus told the apostles, I am going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. What kind of place is Jesus preparing for you? Whatever it is, it's going to be perfect. And it's going to be right. And it will be the place where you spend eternity. And it's there. It's waiting. Stored up. Prepared. Home for you in heaven. I say all these things. Here are the blessings. As a child of God, you get family. You bear the family resemblance. You have a home waiting for you. A, a, a home eternal. And as, and as we are sharing this Christian life together... More and more of these things will come about and our hope and trust in, in that home and looking forward to that home will grow stronger and stronger and stronger. Are you living your life in such a way to take full advantage of all these things? Are you indulging in the family? Bringing what you have to the table and let everybody else bring things to your life as well. Are you bearing that family resemblance? Are you, are you striving to be like and, and, and look like and do the things of Jesus? And are you looking forward to that home and letting, letting the, the promise of that heavenly home affect every day that you walk here on earth and infuse you with hope and faith? That's my lesson this morning. If anybody has any, any need, please come forward while we stand and sing.